Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valero Leof, and welcome to today's broadcast on YouTube. So what we're going to be talking about today is a very exciting topic. We're going to be discussing one of the key patterns, um, which I actually call uh, the, you know, the key to many, many openings, the King's Indian attack. Now, a lot of uh, people know the King's Indian attack just as a structure and formation, which basically appears with the moves of knight f3, g3, bishop g2, and d3, which is more like the reversed King's Indian. But then it's really just more like a King's Indian with a tempo, yet there is so much more to it. Bobby Fischer used to play this extremely successful in many different variations and he was able to both develop his pieces set up a crushing king set attack and often even if he wasn't able to checkmate and do any sacrifices he was holding a long-term pressure which is really what i wanted to talk about uh in today's lecture so which is the first game that i would like to discuss with you i'd like to talk to you about so the first game that I'm going to bring was actually played by Fisher himself. And here it is. Well, i get it open in a moment. Okay. Just one second. So this was actually a game that was played between Fisher and Lam Suren. This is very interesting. Apparently Bobby won. But it's not about, like... Uh, whether he won or not. This game is about how he was able to do this. Very, very interesting. And uh, so let's just see what it was all about. So after the moves of e4, e6, d3, d5, knight v2, knight f6, white plate with the move of pawn up to the j3, g3. And um, let's see. After the move of pawn up to the g3, then, of course, white is getting ready to play with the move bishop g2, knight to the f3, and short castles. I mean, every opening structure is based on the idea that if you develop well and if you develop towards the center quickly, you can get a lot of space. That's basically all white wants to do here. He doesn't want to necessarily get, you know, a brilliant control or something, whatever, like that. It's all about, can you develop fast enough so that your pieces control more space and give you good possibilities for the middle game? And the truth is, yes, he can. And that's what he does. That's what E4 is all about, actually. This is what is going on now. Now, after the move of short castles, black did the same thing. And, of course, apparently white decided to pick up and do e5. And this is where we are getting to the really interesting part portion of the game. And I'm talking about having a pawn on the e5. Now, what am I talking about with this pawn? The idea is that if you ever have a position with four to four pawns on the king side, everything really goes about the, the possibility of advancing the e pawn more. When I was younger, my dad would often teach me that the player who is getting a more advanced e-pawn pushing away the opponent's knight has a very successful set of possibilities that come out naturally. And that's a really interesting idea to comprehend. We understand now what the whole concept behind white structure is. All he wants to do was to basic is, is to basically get the space and uh, you know focus his attention on the king side. Let's take a look and see what really happens. After the move of pawn up to the e5, as it is uh, right now, okay, then uh, black plate with knight d7, rook e1. Of course, it's great to have a pawn just like that, but you got to understand that it's, uh, it's not just about the pawn. It is a lot more about everything else that, uh, you know, comes with that. And so ultimately, it's just about, and right now, it's about white making sure you can protect the pawn. And um, this is good. After continuing with this move of rook to the e1, then obviously black played b5. Starting to advance on the queen side, and he wants to do this as quickly as he can. Makes sense. He's got to be going for it. Now, what's happening next? 
the move b5 white starts building now i've always said it and i always will actually that being successful in any like setup in any actual attack out there first and foremost you need to get more pieces out there and then the second thing that you need to do is to ultimately get more so first is more pieces secondly is more files because if you can get that open Nothing else really matters that much. More pieces and more files. How do we get that? Not if one. This is called maneuvering. The whole point is to make sure that we gather those pieces around against the opponent and then we set them up so that you know the opponent is in trouble. White well, certainly going forward move like h4 now. He's gonna be able to set that knight behind through the h2. He will quickly go ahead with a move of a knight of the g4. And you realize that everything is in place. So this is what we're doing. Step by step, arranging our pieces and moving them closer to attack against the black. That's it. What happens next? Well, this is the move that he actually plays. And now white sets up and moves with h4. Wonderful. Really good move. What is this all about? Oh, well, you could save for yourself. After the h4, there is going to be the possibility to move knight h2. And slowly but consistently, most of white's own pieces are really moving ahead in order to uh, keep black down on the back side. This is great. What comes next? Is there more? Of course. Let's take a look. Let's see it. After this, black plate with a5. Apparently, he had to do this move in order to, I don't know, get ready for knight around and then closing in to the, I suppose, uh, on the queen side. It makes it makes a good sense if it, when he plays it that way. But it's okay. It's not a problem. I mean, after he just does it like this, we're play, playing for bishop f4 and just a small a3. I love that move. It's, it's great. Remember, it is just about the buildup. We're not looking for big tactics or dangerous activity. We just want to get the right build up on the line. Black played this, and then what's happening after after that candidate? After that candidate. Well, after that was done, obviously there was a three. Now a move like a three is usually a move that I would hardly criticize, and the reason is I don't think that. Basically, playing on the side of the board where our opponent is going is a wonderful idea. I don't. On the contrary, I do believe that it is wrong. And we should not do it unless there is any other choice. However, in this case, White does that move because he realizes that stopping Black's whole plan on that area of the board will simply give us extra time and a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to succeed with whatever we've started on the other area. That is key now. So let's do it. After the move um, of uh, a4, okay, basically black didn't like that position, so he actually played, I mean, a3, b day, b day, knight a5 was fairly interesting, and knight e3. You know, you know what's great about this whole structure? Is that white moves undisturbed. He doesn't have to worry. It's easy. In a way, you may actually say this is crazy to think about it. Like, is it possible? Yes, it is. Just keep it coming. And, um, of course, most of Black's own pieces are actually not so good at there. Bishop a6, Bishop h3, b4. Strong attempt of Black to open up the center and maybe advance uh, with, with some of his other you know, remaining pieces is, is a good one. But um, no, I think that it's just not that good out there. So let's see, d4, knight f1. What a terrible move, you would actually say. Why do we need to do this? Why would anybody want to actually go backward in such a way? It's clear. No change. Now remember, in a lot of positions you want change because you want to play, you want to advance or attack, you want to do things. But not here you don't. 
Because in here, it is really all about, you know, White advancing and moving on his pieces further. He would love to play with the move of Knight of the G5. He would like to make all those tactical possibilities grow. And yet, Black is awfully developed on the backside, doing almost nothing here. Knight F1, Knight B6. And what should I do now? Apparently, there's one move, and that's Knight G5. Uh, what is key about this specific position? What is what is critical about that structure overall is how uh, interesting it is for White to really gather all those pieces. It's about that. It's about, okay, let's get those pieces to really move around and close it on to the, close on to the opponent. It's a wonderful move. It is a great idea because it helps White to set up with Queen to the G4. And it is just the fact that uh, Black is so far down, he can't do much. What, is, what did Black do now? Well, actually, this is the point where Black had to do Knight d5. And this is the moment where he is uh, trying to drive the light to dark square bishop out of the way. And White simply goes back. Down with the bishop in the d2. He goes. Black plays. Bishop takes g5. Bishop takes g5. Queen to the d7, and this is the moment where White sets up his own queen on the h5. A wonderful idea. You can see how this, it just flows. You see, everything seems to flow effectively on the king's side area. What about black? Well, it's hard to say. There's nothing that clear that he's actually moving on to, and then White just keeps on going. Strong, powerful challenge or pressure against black black did rook to the c8 and now white plays alongside knight d2 this knight is coming around we're getting to play with the move of knight of the e4 now we're getting to play with knight of the d6 have a wonderful setup to you know hold black on the back side and the down and that's great further away black is in trouble he plays knight c3 now, let's see if you guys have any suggestion on how White should continue in this position. Do you, do you think that there is anything particular, anything specific that White can do? Just think for a second, and let's see what White can come up with. Great position. Hmm. You know, um, when I have to, when I'm, when I'm getting to think about such a structure and situation, uh, there come, there are a couple of ideas that come to my mind, and the first one being is that White has to find no other moves but on the king's side. And while you're thinking about that, I also wanted to advise you one more thing, which is if you get a chance, just like the IHS is providing a brilliant, brilliant. Uh, incredible 165 volume of the Foxy Mega Bundle. This is like the largest collection of instructive chess videos that you can get at an incredible price. It is actually, I think it's uh, like, what, 70% off or something like that? And this whole thing is with 165 volumes means many, many hours of training with some of the top grandmasters of chess. It's like 165, I think every course is about three or four hours, if not more longer. And it comes with a 100% money back guarantee in case you're not satisfied. It is incredible. I mean, this is probably one of the best set of training tools that I've ever seen. So it's videos that you can study for years and yet it is, I mean, usually the, the price of that course is a thousand bucks, but now it's like 70% off or something like that. So it is a, is a wonderful possibility. I'd recommend you to check it from the link below the lecture or from the chat link that I've just sent. So take a look. It's a wonderful, incredible offer. That's not something you want to miss. All right, so knight e4, I got an idea. All right, knight e4 is not that bad. I like that. Did Fisher do it? He thought about it. It was not a bad idea. We, we definitely do want to do that move, but no. See, 
that's not exactly a very focused move. What you want to do is to focus entirely on the king side. Bishop f6. Even though the knight e4 is a good, relatable move. I love it. But the problem is that it is not the kind of move that we want in order to advance your plan. I mean, indirectly it may influence it, but we don't care. What we care about is the shot on the king side. What we care about is the G7 pressure that we're going for. We care about those type of things. We care about the the the, the ability to keep black down. So um, this is a wonderful thing. After that, obviously black is in a deep trouble, and it's going to continue being there. It's really just the way to go. Wonderful, specific, and dangerous. Black, of course, couldn't take it. He's taken it. In case of G dix F, the E dix F Queen G5 is gonna be a killer, so he couldn't really play along that line. It would have been a, a very destructive type of sequence. So basically, Black decided to come down with his queen and try to solidify the position. I mean, he was right. You know, it's like if there is anything he can do, that has to go with that type of variation. It has to be with the queen moving back. Makes sense a decent candidate. Probably he's not that perfect, but uh, he's got to do it. And after this was played, now an e4, you see. So we did it. After all, this is not something that we were we were never going to do. This was something that what White wanted to do. But in some way, it's just that now he decides to go for it much, much better and much more beautifully. And it's, it's wonderful. The key is this you have the area of the board where you'd like to advance great just keep your play there don't deviate knight e4 pawn of the g6 and then comes the plan of queen g5 wow that's great now we're having the dark squares totally under our control it helps us to undermine Black's position if the queen comes down to the uh, the h6 square. Black played knight takes d4, rook takes d4. It's, I, I think that this game, besides its apparent ability to show us the strength of this opening, one of the things that you find is that it brings you to the idea of any successful opening or any successful plan as of that matter. The real idea about these positions is that what you want most is the chance to get as many pieces as you possibly can against your opponent and open up as many lines as you can. So we can have that idea ability to play with h5. We can have the opportunity to play with a move of, um, you know, like maybe maybe in that position, uh, h6 to the g, rook to the h4 in that moment. And this is going to be wonderful. Step by step, all you need is more power. Well, black played c4. He was certainly intending to open up the position, but then white does h5. And, and you can see it now. It's not just about the bishop. It's not about the queen, the rook, or the pawn. We, we just want to have more firepower on that area. The more firepower we get, the stronger and more difficult will be for the opponent to really hold on to everything. And uh, that's the way to go. H5, C dix to the D, and then there is the move of Rook H4. We don't even care. It's that bad. We don't even, white doesn't even care about what black is doing on the opposite side of the board. And this is a beautiful thing because if you look at it, uh, you know, it looks like we should, and we don't. You know, the only thing that matters is what goes on the king's side, and it's just great. Rook h4, then rook a7, and then, of course, white plays bishop to g2. We've got bishop e4, we've got g6 under attack, we've got our, all our pieces in place. The, the x to c, queen h6, just amazing. Imagine the amazing amount of forces, all well set and introduced in the in the tactics against the black king this is impossible to defend he tried queen f8 apparently in order to uh, you know just drive our own queen out of the way 
But then uh, White just played Queen takes H7. And that was it. Very clean, very cut, very easy and straightforward out there. Um, and uh, Black was just, I mean, he was done basically after that move. Queen takes H7, King takes H7, H takes G, Bishop taking takes G, Bishop E4. That focus is what I've seen most chess players do not know how to do. Because when it comes down to focusing your pieces or focusing your play, usually uh, most of them get to think a little bit more about, uh, you know, general candidates or like, you know, I, I'm gonna do, I can do this. And uh, I don't think that it is about the amount of moves you spend doing this or that. It is about the amount of moves you spend in particularly advancing your play towards the area where you want it to go. And when that happens, it's all going right. This is what White wanted. His bear, bishop pair was wonderful. The rest of his pieces were, were very relevant and uh, basically great. And then Black just couldn't fight that. It's the reason why he lost it. One of the things that I love about this whole structure from the very beginning was just the buildup. The buildup and consistency. Something you can take on brilliantly, beautifully from such a game. It's how can I just be more consistent with pretty much everything I do. Every single move uh, that, that I, I get to follow it. It was just so wonderfully advanced and White was able to, to get it all, you know, in perfect ways against Black's position. Solid, consistent, and very relevant. Impossible to just ignore the power of everything. So that was pretty much what I wanted to, to mention about this game. Now, I'd like to bring up another one that was actually played between Fisher and Pano. This game was another brilliant example of the Kings in an attack and the typical structure that White is supposed to advance with. Let's take a look and see. For sure was white. He started with uh, a knight of three. Okay, e4, c5, knight of three, e6. And um, so let's take a look. And after the move, e6, then d4, the dg3, bishop to the g2, castles, rook e1, and then c3. White played alongside the move of, um, you know, d4. And then actually after that, let's, let's see what's happened here. d4, c takes to the d, c takes to the d. It's a really nice example here because white is certainly applying quite a good tension around the center. And then after that move, black plays d5. So he's basically getting to push that pawn, get a little bit more space, and things are not as bad as it seems, as they seem. White advances with e5 here, and then knight to the c3. Rook c8, and then bishop to f4, knight a5. Rook c1, b5, and then white goes with the move of pawn up to the b3. So this is very, very important. And, you know, one of the things that you find out about this type of position is you've got to get, you know, like that sort of a little bit of a momentum, you see. So it, it doesn't, it, it takes time. It doesn't come out very quick, okay? So first thing that you need to do is make sure that you build up. See, like, this is a great idea to play with. After we get that move of pawn up to the b3, uh, b4, knight to the e2, bishop to the b5, and then white plays with the move queen to the d2. So knight c6 and white plays g4. What is so brilliant about this position is that now if black advances with knight to the f5, then, uh, you know, just obviously we cannot do it. We're not going to allow that. We've got moves like knight to the g3. We've got bishop h6 to follow. And uh, that's that's great. g4, a5, and knight to the g3. Pawn the queen to the b6, and then white plays with the move pawn up to the h4. This is um, very, very important out there. So what is this all about? Well, White just keeps on advancing. That's all he wants. Keep advancing, create more pressure, and expand the position on the king's side. This is what we're looking for. Is there more to that? Absolutely. But for now, this is the key. H4, Black plays knight of the b8, and then, of course, White plays bishop h6. One of the 
really interesting parts about such a position is that, you know, now you see how we're able to advance pieces and pawns together. That's a brilliant idea. Because when you advance pieces and pawns together, it just helps you beautifully. You get all the pressure in the attacks. We've got moves like queen to the f4. And then uh, after that, black can play with knight at the d7. Then white does queen to g5. It's perfect. It's a really good move. And, um, you know, that is, that's how it's going to work out. We've got the move of queen to the f6. That would mean eventually when the knight moves. But see, it's, it's easy. Black can't do much. Really, I feel very comfortable about showing you this because there's almost no real conflict going on. There's no queen side played in this moment. And uh, that is really, really good. I mean, what can black do? Rook takes to the c1. Rook takes to the c1. Then bishop takes to the h6 out there. And uh, then after that, bishop takes to h6. Queen takes to h6. Rook to the c8. Rook takes the c8, knight takes the c8, and uh, this is great. It's perfect possibility out there. So we are having the having the extra pressure out there. And um, yes, one of the key things is that uh, first and foremost, you have not. You, there's no need for you to actually sacrifice. Sacrificing is going to be a very bad idea. Don't do it. Unless you really, really have to, don't do it. It's not going to work all too well. Just keep the opponent, you know, on the backside. So let's see. And after that move, then, of course, white plays with the move of pawn to the h5. What I like about this position is that we're seeing you know, not just white's own pieces, but, uh, you know, Really, the, the possibility to keep up, to keep everything going on that side of the board. Queen to the eight, and then uh, of course we have that idea of playing a move of knight of the g five, and this is great. Set up pressure, set up pressure. It's a wonderful line. Most of Black's own pieces just have very little or nothing to do, and then uh, after that, knight to the f eight, White plays bishop e four. And I feel like I've shown you this game some time before, but it's so instructive that really being able to repeat it just makes for such a powerful possibility out there. It is a great move, a really good possibility to keep the attack going. Queen e7. And then what is actually happening in this position? Well, white's just knight takes f7. This is the way to go. Perfect efficient and really wonderful no need to worry remember that you've got to think about which pieces or like which which colors you've got so you could set the pieces in there and then bring everything together bring all the attack and all that power it is um it is great knight takes h7 and then knight takes h7, h6 the g. So this this is this is a great way to play it. So after you play with the move of h6 to the g6, black is well he's kind of down actually. You know if he plays f takes g, you can play queen takes the g. So and what would have happened if black was just took it? I mean maybe if you would have taken with the d takes to the e4 earlier, knight takes to the e4. Then what's really happening? is we're just getting to um, target. Okay, F7 is, is hanging in this type of position, and uh, it's, it's he's dead. Can't do anything. Oh, in the game, black played queen e7. Knight takes h7. Destroys the king's side, takes out the protection, and when we do, it is impossible that he defends it. Knight g5. And, uh, of course, after that move of knight to the h5, here, knight f3, king to the g2, and um, then knight h4, king to the g3. And so this is great. What I like about this is that, you know, most of black pieces feel awfully bad. And they really do. It's like if he plays with knight takes g6, as he does in this position, nothing else. White sets up his own knight on the f6 square. We see the pain that Black will experience because of his horrible king. 
And uh, that's about it. It is terrific. Knight of six, king of seven, queen h7 check. If he goes back with that king on the f8, of course, we've got queen to the g8. It's a very clear-cut example that sets you up for the for the whole idea, how it works, what you need to do, and what the different principles or possibilities are. It's just, you know, it was wonderful to play. The key thing you've got to remember out there, you know, and then we just we really go back to the beginning of this game, is consistency. Then, actually, after the e5, knight of the c3, bishop f4, we realize how white was able to so effectively, you know, move on. And uh, that's great. This is just like pieces, pawns. Simple as that. Nothing to worry about and uh, nothing to be nothing to be concerned of. So white got the white really got the ability to play with g4 plus knight g3 advance towards the king side, get those pieces in. And as the pieces move forward and white was able to deliver them, there was very little that black could do. So white just completely squashed black on the king side area as it happened. So I want to show you another super cool game that Fisher was having. So let me take a look. All right, see it. This next game, no, you can sacrifice. I mean, it's not like you don't want to sacrifice. You just want to sacrifice when you're sure that it will work. This is played between Fisher and Joaquin Manuel Durao. Fisher was white. He started off with the same opening structure, which basically allows stability in the center. And sometimes the opportunity to control. This was a great possibility. D4, D6, C, D to the C, D to the C, and then white plays queen e2. What's so lovely about this is that not only white is ready to go for a move like rook to the d1, but he also has moves like e5 and, and bishop g5 and a few others. So the flexibility is perfect. The control. Oh, well, just as well. B6, E5. As I've mentioned previously, the big deal is that as soon as E5 is on, it's going to be about playing for Bishop G5. It's going to be about the terrific idea of the, you know, the knight to come forward and move. And what about black? Well, that's the problem. It doesn't look like black's got anything that huge. He plays A5, and this is where white plays rook to the E1. It is perfect. We've got knight d2 plus knight e4. We've got bishop to the g5 that we can deliver. And we've got black really on the back side. Down behind passively. This is great. What does what does happen what in here? Well, black played bishop to the a6, queen e4, rook to a7, and then surely white plays with knight to the d2. Okay, black does bishop to d3. And then, of course, white plays queen to h4. Now, what is quite interesting about this is just really that type of buildup. Now, what you'd like to understand is this. When you have a strong buildup, you know, in terms of solid pieces and commands, good command, it's much easier for, for the pieces to flow and really move together and, and, and go ahead against the opponent. Moves like knight e4, bishop g5 possibilities to confront him that's really much simpler to do to introduce and so it certainly works out great black plays knight of the d5 queen takes d8 now why would fisher exchange the queens right now it makes very little to no sense why would you do that i mean we would want to keep our pieces on the board and we don't want to exchange why the reason why we need to do this and why is it so it's so necessary is because End games are generally known as quite bad, but the real key is that in a position like this, you need to exchange queens because now that's going to be really interesting to talk about. The end game is superior for the player who gets more space and control, and that's the big deal. 
After queen takes to the d8, rook takes to the d8, and then a4, we've cut off black's ability to prompt playing b5, so black doesn't get to do it this way. And then, for example, uh, once black plays a rook a to b7, we've got bishop f1. In case of the exchange, we've got the move of uh, knight to the c4, so we can control the d6 square, and that's a good thinking. Bishop takes f1, king takes f1. Knight e7, knight c4. And then, for example, after that, knight c8, white played bishop to the g5. The end game is really bad for black, for a number of reasons and why is that because of the peace activity the most important thing okay that matters in such a position is the activity of the pieces and now black is horrible he's got this horrid development of his knight on the c8 which is uh, uh really awful and the majority of black's other pieces are, are as bad as as they can as they can be okay so um this is very interesting now bishop to the g5, knight e7, and then white plays knight b2. The best way on how you can get better pieces for the end game is to regroup them, maneuver them. Think about where can you put them in and just get them over. So right now, now white is actually playing with the move of uh, knight of the e4. And then, for instance, after that knight e4, we can have knight of the d6. It's going to be a perfect position, great possibility, step for uh, definitely step by step. Okay, so now black played with the move h6 in this position, and uh, oh, surely white plays bishop takes e7, rook takes d7, rook a3, rook c7, and then there is rook to the b3. Black does rook to the c6, knight e4, bishop f8, and white simply does king e2. You know, one of the things that I find very interesting about this is that, uh, you know, with, with each of his, of, of his pieces, black is awfully passive and backward. He can't do anything, really. That It's as bad as it gets. Black plays bishop to the e7, and then surely white plays f4. This definitely continues, and then we have black's ability, inability to play a move of pawn up to the f6. Certainly can't go anywhere. And um, so this, this is beautiful. Step by step, what you need to remember is to think how. It's a big idea, actually, that you would like to remember. Step by step, how can you improve your pieces and restrict your opponent? That's all you've got to work on in the end game, actually. So this is very valuable. And uh, after that move, obviously, of the f4, king to the f8, and then g4. Then, of course, king e8, rook to the f1 was, was pretty powerful. And, yeah, just we keep on going. We advance, and we uh, just follow through. So rook f3, rook h3, knight takes a5. And this is the moment where you realize the final chapter. When your pieces are so incredibly active and well-advanced, it doesn't matter what the opponent's going to do. The point is he's going to stay passive and just like, feel horrible. That's what you need to be doing. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, there's very, you know, there's really, really nothing that black can do. Knight takes a5, rook to c7, and knight c4 to maintain a great extra pressure against the b6 pawn. Black, black attacks with rook to the a7. And then white plays knight x to b6. You may find it exciting to know that, I mean, after knight x a5, there was nothing the black could have done in that moment. Even if he did capture with b to a, it would be knight f6, king e7, rook b7, and, and the checkmate. I mean, it's not like he could go anywhere or do anything. It is a bad position where he's got to retreat. And then as soon as we play with knight c4, knight x to the b, and knight f6 check, None of black's pieces are in condition to fight back. We've got moves like rook to the d3, and then, uh, you know, there's so much more. All right, so after that position, black plays king to d8, rook c6, rook to c7, and the check. Now, being two pawns up, all that white has to do is to just uh, follow up very easily. And then rook c8, exchange, and the rook to d7. 
king to c6, and then the move of rook takes f7. Extra pressure against the black bishop, a strong knight on f6 that holds black's king down. And, and you know, the reality is that most of black's other pieces just don't feel like they're going anywhere. It, it, he's, he's back, he's behind, he's uh, down passive, and uh, that's really about everything. He is awful. Now, what happens next? Well, black plays c4 in this moment, hoping to get that light square, dark square bishop out on the play, maybe through the c5. But it doesn't matter because after the move of pawn up to the c4, then white plays knight d7. It, it hits the bishop on f8 out there. And, uh, you know, just uh, it's, it's good. So the key thing, very, very important, key thing is keep the pieces coordinated. Now, that's the highest value in the end game. Now, you can do different things, but really that's the first. How do you get your pieces to connect together and apply more pressure versus the opponent? That's what you need to get. Because after knight of the d7, bishop c5, of course, white exchanges it. Black has to retake in here, which is awful, apparently, for you know number of reasons. And then after that move, rook to the c7 check, king d5. And then, of course, white plays with b4. Virtually any move would have won, but b4 create uh, what I'd call an, like a checkmating net around the black king's territory. And um, that's, that's a really, really interesting idea. Most of black's own pieces are bad. He can't go anywhere. He's really just behind and passive and backward. And that's what that's what you need to do. So one of the interesting thing in this type of position is remember, you have to make sure that you focus on this. Coordination and restriction are mutually connected because when you combine your piece and you push the opponent back on defense, he's feeling restricted. Now that's exactly what White is able to do right now. Very powerful, very efficient. And then after B4, apparently Black can't do anything. If he plays C dix to the B, we do King to the D3. And if he doesn't, I mean, what else is he going to do? Just B5 is happening. Rook C, you know, if you if you do take here, it's King E3 with the impossibility to defend against Rook C5 check. It's it's a checkmating attack, and Black is down. What I love so much about this position is the wonderful resource. Every piece set up to advance and keep Black down. It was a great idea. Black was definitely down, and then, uh, you know, just, it's great. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you. Now, there's one more game, quick game I want to bring up. This was played between Fischer and Ivkov. This was played in the uh, second Piotrgorsky Cup 1966, which brings up a lot of the motives you could use of this opening. Okay. So let's see. First of all, Fischer started with e4. Now you can go with the king sitting it on the king sitting attack with this order. e4, knight f3, g3. Okay. And um, after knight f3, d3, and g3, why just follow the king sitting approach exactly in the same way? So after bishop g2, why plays knight at h4 out there? And everything looks great. What's going on next? Well, after knight h4, black played b6, and white advanced with f4. Dx to the e, dx to the e. What I really love about that position is how each of white's pieces really seems to fit the best squares possible. We have e5 available now. We've got queen to g4. We've got c3 and everything else. This is a wonderful thinking. Step by step, why is advancing just it's um uh, it's a really really good and what what do we do next the dedix to the e4 black blade with bishop to the a6 and then after bishop a6 rookie one c4 and of course white plays in the move of c3 knight to the a5 and what is white going to do in that type of position well actually we've got e5 
bishop to c5 check, king h1, knight d5, and then knight e4. Bishop b7, and surely white sets up his, his own queen against the opponent's h7 pawn. So uh, one of the uh, really, really interesting uh, things about this position is that white isn't just ready to advance on the, uh, you know, against the opponent's um, h7, but he's got so many pieces that can, you know, move against that. So this is really powerful out there. Very interesting, really efficient. After queen to the h5, Basically, black, what black did was knight e7. And this is the moment where white plays with g4. What is so great about this situation is that, you know, the, the whole version of every piece that white has on the king set area is terrific. We've got f5. We've got the bishop coming down on the g5 out there. We've got everything in the play. And what is so wonderful about that is the rest it's just we have bishop g5 we got the f6 we've got the we've got the activity out there and uh, it's all it's all well and good black had decided to play with the move of bishop takes to the e4 in that moment and then after the move of bishop takes the e4 bishop takes to the e4 g6 and white certainly plays with the move of queen to h6 we're getting to advance that queen as powerfully as possible with the move of f5 and uh that's a great way to go just f5 plus bishop g5 that bishop is going to go to the mm, i don't know to the f6 again black has absolutely no confidence i know that i'm praising this opening a little bit more than i should but again it's a really good opening we've got that bishop coming out there and um that's wonderful out there step by step that's what you can do remember and now what Black is doing is uh, not, I mean, he doesn't really have that much in this position. He actually played with knight b5, hoping to set things up. But um, now, nah, really, it doesn't, it doesn't work for him too well. Uh, as soon as it's done, White plays with the move f5, rook to the e8 in this position. And then after the move of rook to the e8 is played, White plays f takes the g. f takes the g. Knight takes the g6. It is terrific, wonderful, and really threatening against black. One of the, uh, you know, like, key ideas is that once you get all those pieces really well set against the opponent, things are going to work out perfect. That's brilliant. Knight takes g6, forces him to play with the move queen to the d7, and then surely nice and white plays with the move knight to f4. If black plays with the move of, um, you know, knight takes f4, we're going to have the move of uh, bishop takes f, plus rook to the d1, extra pressure against h7, and that's just really great. Rook d8, knight h5, king h8, knight f6. Once black actually captured it, white just takes back with e takes f, and then, uh, you know, this is great. The key about this whole situation is that Black was not even able to call a shot. It wasn't even able to really bring anything there. It's just a horrible position with a lot of extra problems in that moment. And uh, now with the bishop f4, rook takes g4, rook to the d1. Now white's obviously winning. Black can't take on the d1 due to the h7 checkmate, and this is already losing it. He tried to I don't know, confront the g1, but then white plays f7, and that kills him, really. It's the moment where you realize he can't go on. He can't do a checkmate on g1. h7 hangs. The queen is bad. e5 is going with a check. Black is horrible. What I really like about this game is that it kind of illustrates very well that playing the kings in an attack is all about following the consistent attack on the king's side. While you, all you need to do is to keep blockading his pieces from ever advancing and targeting you on the other side, you want to keep going and pressure directly the king. It was really well done by White, and so he was very successful as everything worked out. Once again, I'd like to recommend you the perfect course of um, 
many grandmasters. It's 165 actual courses by some of the best grandmasters in the history, offered at, this, at an incredible 70% discount on the, from the link below the video. So free for, feel free to check it out. And um, actually, if or you could also click the link on the chat. It's only available for a few hours. So um, make sure that you hurry. And I definitely recommend that you check some of the typical games of Fisher on this opening because they're really brilliant. If you want, I can send you some um, as excellent games that he's played and other players have played in this opening. In any case, thank you so very much. And uh, if you have any questions or you want me to ask me anything specific, you could always do it uh, through my email, which is valerialuke.lilov at gmail.com or on my website, tigerlilov.com. Again, thank you for so much for joining me tonight, and I'll speak to you next Saturday.